I think all sensible people have the British Constitution as one of their hobbies. It is the most interesting uh, matter to, to discuss and be informed about. As Dicey said, Dicey argued, it is Parliament that is the defender of the liberties of the people, of our ancient constitution and of our freedoms. I, I give way. Well, good afternoon, or indeed good morning, or good evening, as you prefer. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, continuing my ruminations on our representative democracy in an effort to show why Parliament works for people in all parts of the United Kingdom. This week, I'm joined by the first ever woman to hold one of the most important roles in the civil service for Parliament, that of First Parliamentary Council. Elizabeth Gardner heads the team of legislative drafters whose work transforms the policy ambitions of ministers into legal reality. Her contribution is certainly appreciated by ministers as the Minister for the Constitution, Chloe Smith, made clear in my last episode. I do pay tribute to, to, to many of the public servants that, that, that do this work for us. Um, and I often think, actually, about how we could um, explain this role more to the public. Um, you know, you, you, we've, all, we've all had conversations with our constituents where somebody says, oh, my goodness me, what on earth were they thinking of when they wrote this into law? And actually, what we... What we we might try to explain is that there's a there's a team of people in in the office of parliamentary council who do exactly that work of trying to write really complicated things down into law so that they function so that they work and you know this reminds us of, of what the point of good law is at all you know it, it is to be able to to um make people's everyday lives uh more predictable more accountable you know for there to be redress when redress when when something might have gone horribly wrong um for there to be security and for there not to be you know an abuse of power within that but for there to be a kind of um enabling power well the minister's obviously right and i can't think of anyone more qualified to tell us what good law looks like than Elizabeth Gardner. Could you begin by explaining to me what the Office of Parliamentary Council actually does? The Office of Parliamentary Council consists of around 50 government lawyers, both barristers and solicitors, and we specialise in drafting primary legislation. So that's the bills which then become Acts of Parliament. We work very closely with government departments to translate their policy into law. Our job is not to operate some sort of sausage machine, which I think some people think it might be, that takes perfect policy and turns it into legalese. That couldn't be further from the truth. A large part of our role is, to, is analysis, looking at what's proposed and how it fits together and how it fits into the wider legislative landscape. And in this way, we work with the departments to ensure their legislative solutions are robust, they're coherent and they're complete. And more, more, uh, more importantly, we want them to stand the test of time. So uh, we want to ensure that, you know, if that statute has to be on the statute book for 10 years, it's still operating effectively in 10 years time. So our role will often begin when legislation is first being considered by a department and will remain involved right through the process, uh, right through the parliamentary process, indeed, drafting government amendments and dealing with procedural issues in parliament and sometimes even beyond Parliament, giving advice about implementation and about structures within the bill. So for lawyers who love the law, being a parliamentary council is an absolutely fascinating job. We regularly have to master the law in new areas in order to draft changes. And our legislation covers every area you can imagine, every area, every aspect of human life, from matters of national or international importance to very technical fixes for very specific issues. And people may generally think of legislation in terms of criminal penalties and prohibitions, but much of our legislation is actually about facilitating activity and encouraging certain courses of action. So in recent years, we've produced legislation about EU exit, obviously, but also about the space industry, data protection, the recent stamp duty changes, civil claims for whiplash injuries, and early release of prisoners. And that's just a small aspect. I mean, I could go on and on uh, just about every aspect of human life. And because there's such a body of law already, every time a new law comes in, it has to adjust lots of old laws, doesn't it? I, I was very struck um, when looking at the draft, um, actually the bill for reform of the House of Lords, that it had in it a proposed repeal 
of an act from the 1530s setting out the seats that members of the House of Lords take when the Lords is sitting. And it must require an extraordinary wide knowledge to know that when you change one bit of the law, there are all these other intricate parts of the law that also need to be amended. Well, I'd like to claim that we knew every corner of the statute book, but I think that might be uh, overclaiming. But what we do have are the, the tools and the skills to track down those various amendments that we might need to make. Um, I think we're, we're very fortunate, probably compared to our predecessors, in that we have electronic tools that help us to do that. So having the statute book online and being able to search for key phrases is a really helpful way of identifying things that you might need to change. Departments will also have quite good knowledge of their area of law and will be able to identify things. But it is very easy to miss something. Um, and the, the disadvantage we have compared to our predecessors is that the statute book is, has become so vast that it is very easy not to spot something. Um, I mean, I remember doing legislation a few years ago that allowed Roman Catholic clergy to stand as members of parliament. And it was quite late in the day when we suddenly twigged that what we were doing also required us to say something about Lord's spiritual in the House of Lords. We could quite easily have missed that. So it is, it is, um, it's a very important aspect of changing the law. And yet, um, it's, when people are focused on the key policy, it's often seen as the kind of also ran part of the instructions and parliamentary council are often trying to get departments to really focus on the need to make sure that those parts of the instructions are also worked up um, and clear so that we can make sure that the whole statute book fits together. And and that perhaps is the hardest part of, part of your task, isn't it? There's a great um, quotation from Robin Cook's diary where he says, it is the brute fact that there are fewer than 50 parliamentary draftsmen working for the government. They each have a positively stakhanovite commitment to their job and in the past session we got one bill published in time only by its draftsman sitting up through the night putting the finishing touches to it and because you're the last bit before the bill lands in parliament you're the bit that to some extent people um, most take for granted because you always deliver and squeeze by not giving you the instructions early enough. I think it's it's always it's always a bit of a balance, isn't it? Um, people want to get on and get their bills into Parliament, um, and as you say, we are often at, seen as at the end of the line. I mean, one of the things that we are increasingly trying to do is get in with departments earlier, uh, further up the line, to start to think about what they're proposing and how it might work, so that when it arrives with us, we have some idea of what's coming, and we've been able to. Um, see off any particular problems that um, might have been have been caused by original proposals, but it is a constant battle. And um, obviously, we have a, a lot of legislation going through Parliament all the time. And at the moment, we've got a very heavy program. So, um, Parliamentary Council are working incredibly hard. I mean, I'm very fortunate to have a fantastic team of council who are incredibly professional and dedicated to what they do. They really believe in the value of having good legislation and are willing to go above and beyond. And as you say, they are sit through the night if necessary to do what's needed to get it into the best possible shape. Um, you know, they, they have a great sense of pride in their legislation um, and want it to be as good as possible when it, when it hits Parliament. And, and rightly so, because some legislation uh, remains on the statute book for decades, doesn't it? The... Um uh, um, obviously, the Bill of Rights has lasted hundreds of years. Our major constitutional documents last a very long time. But something like the Police and Criminal Evidence Act has lasted now for nearly 40 years. And that things that may be thought of as routine law, as you said earlier, have to survive a long time. So what do you think makes a good law? So I think in the Parliamentary Council Office, we're when we think about what makes a good law, we're interested in whether a law is uh, clear, whether it's um, effective primarily, and whether it's necessary. So we're trying to produce legislation that ticks all of those boxes. In terms of clarity, I think getting the structure of the Act right plays a really big part in how clear it is and how easy it is to read. And people can be a bit fixated about the actual words on the page, but I think structure is as important and sometimes more important to the overall clarity. So that is particularly challenging if you put a bill into Parliament and then it's then heavily amended. Uh, and we use a sort of analogy in the office that, you know, you've crafted a beautiful 
um, elephant uh, and you get it into Parliament and they decide that they actually want a crocodile. And so you're hacking bits off your bill um, and adding some teeth and taking off the trunk. Uh, and it may look a bit like a crocodile when it finishes, but it doesn't look as nice a crocodile as it would have done if you'd known from the start that you were designing a crocodile. So um, having the structure in the right place when you introduce into Parliament and being able to maintain that structure throughout Parliament is really important. But clarity is also about language. And I think legislation's come a very long way in this regard over my career, certainly. We aim to draft in plain everyday language with relatively short sentences and avoiding legalese. And I think in that respect, we've been um, ahead of the private legal profession in the way that we draft and the sort of legalese that you would find even today in some legal documents you won't find in modern legislation. But there's always a balance to be struck. And when drafting in some technical fields, it can actually be helpful to use technical language and terms of art, which are understood by the main audience for that legislation. And it can be very unhelpful to start using different language in an attempt to modernise when you're trying to fit into, as you said, a very complex existing statute book, which uses certain language. If we start using different words, then readers and the courts might understandably think we we intend to have a different concept and mean something different. So if we actually mean the same thing as something that's already on the statute book, it may be better to reflect the existing wording. Um, and legislation, of course, first and foremost, needs to be effective. It needs to deliver the policy intent and not give rise to any unintended consequences. There's, there's no point in having legislation that is beautifully written in a clear and accessible way if, in fact, it completely fails to give effect to the policy. And we live in an incredibly complex world. And as a result, policies are often very complex. For example, a simple proposition may have to be subject to exceptions to ensure the policy works in a fair way. And those exceptions may be difficult to express concisely if they're to hit their target. Or in the tax world, um, you know, many people are trying to get around the tax legislation. And so that often um, creates added complexity while we're trying to ensure uh, that avoidance can't creep in. So legislation, you know, it, it is innately, some of it, complex, but we are trying to make it as clear um, and coherent as we can in the circumstances. And inevitably, as legislation is amending previous legislation, you don't write it all out again. So when, um, as a Member of Parliament, you're reading through a bill and it says um, that this clause um, amends a clause in an act from a previous parliament, you don't necessarily have the full context of that in front of you. But that if you put the full context in, the bill would become even larger and simply the volume of words you would have would complicate the process. So there's an inevitable complexity and a need for legal understanding, isn't there, in understanding, um, comprehending uh, legislation when you read through it. There is. And, and leg legislating by textual amendment, um, it comes down to who the audience for the legislation is. And this is something that we're always trying to balance as well, because we have many audiences for our legislation. Um, parliamentarians in Parliament is, is one audience, um, and the end user of that legislation is another audience. And textual amendment um, is good for the end user in that they will have a consolidated version of the, the legislation with the old legislation with the new amendments added into it. For parliamentarians, that's not so good because they are just faced with a list of amendments which can look completely incomprehensible. Um, and it's trying to find ways to facilitate understanding of that in Parliament. And we can do things like um, through the explanatory notes, we can help set the amendments in context. But we can also produce um, copies of the existing legislation with the bill's amendments added into them so that people can see what those amendments are doing. Um, I completely agree that in, in practical terms, rewriting it all, all the time is not going to be possible. Occasionally, we will rewrite things just when we're very conscious they've been very heavily amended before or they're being very heavily amended at the moment, and it might be better to set them out afresh. But that's um, the exception rather than the rule. Um, the other thing with rewriting, of course, is it wouldn't highlight the actual changes that the government's making at, at this point. Um, and it, you would get sort of bogged down in revisiting aspects of the policy that were pa passed by Parliament in the past, rather than focusing on the specific changes that the government's trying to make now. And, and that's where some of the politics comes in with um, the legislation, that it's, 
not just about law, it's also about the government presenting its agenda. But I wanted to ask you in terms of the writing of bills, the balance that you have to strike between primary and secondary legislation and the competing interests of Parliament and um, the executive in this, that Parliament, and particularly the House of Lords, very often wants very precise laws and limited secondary powers. Ministers very often want flexibility so that the law can be adjusted to meet changing circumstances, not in principle, but in detail. And I wonder, how do you advise on the balance between the two? And when you're writing a good law, when we're aiming for this perfect law, how much of it do you think should be left as secondary? And and what balance would you like to see as primary? We will always work with departments to discuss the approach they want to take. Um, In different areas of law, historically, different approaches have been taken. So some areas of law are very heavily dependent on secondary legislation and other areas are not. And so that will often influence the initial approach. Um, And then there can be all sorts of factors come into play. It may be that some aspects of the legislation just cannot be written at the moment. So when we were doing the legislation recently about the space industry, for instance, there was a lot of uncertainty about how that's going to play out over, over future years. And therefore, we couldn't set everything in stone initially, and we had to provide for flexibility. I think Parliamentary Council will always be encouraging departments to ensure that the sort of principles of their policy are firmly set out in the statute, um, and that the secondary legislation, therefore, has a sort of guiding framework um, to ensure that Parliament can really understand what it is that that secondary legislation is going to do. So um, not to just completely devolve the policy into the secondary legislation. You know, obviously, the government has had um, many discussions with the House of Lords over recent years about approaches. um, And often, uh, we've been able to meet halfway. There's, There's often a middle ground. I think some of the things we discuss with departments are about how they can Um, meet concerns about the breadth of their powers. They can make sure that the powers clearly don't allow people to do certain things, for example, create new criminal offences or powers of entry or things that are um, thought to be controversial in secondary legislation. And also the degree to which Parliament is going to be interested in scrutinising that legislation. So what form of procedure should that have in the House? Um, and you know other things like consultation requirements, who should the government be required to consult before it makes the secondary legislation. And so for the wider powers, those can be um, safeguards that reassures Parliament that, that nothing untoward is going to happen uh, further down the line, because they will be seeing that legislation when it comes forward. And this ties in with what you were saying earlier about unintended consequences, that you don't want to give a power that can then be used in a way that was um, not expected not planned when the original legislation was passed. One of the major bills that you wrote recently was the EU Withdrawal Act, which obviously had a lot of secondary legislation um, attached to it. How did you and your team work towards preparing that bill before it became an act? Yeah, so, I mean, that was obviously an incredibly significant piece of legislation. Uh, But as with most pieces of legislation, the work begins with early discussions with the department, in this case, um, DEXU, um, about the sort of legal legal implications of the UK leaving the European Union. And um, obviously, a large part of our law was contained in EU instruments that had direct effect here, or in domestic instruments, which gave effect to EU law. And the policy intention was to ensure continuity of law immediately after exit day. And so a lot of the discussion was focused around how we could create a legal structure that would best achieve that. Um, And, you know, there were various options. And uh, I've never worked on a bill where there were so many um, external commentaries. So we had a lot of benefit of other people's opinions on how it ought to be done. We quite appreciate that. Um, It was very interesting to read Um, other people's views on how things could be done um, and to see to what extent they overlapped with the the approach that we were thinking of taking. So um, we found that uh, actually very helpful. Within the department, there was obviously a bill team of officials there to manage the bill and then policy officials advising on the various elements of the policy and lawyers advising them and instructing us as parliamentary council. 
Um, but in a bill like the EU withdrawal bill, there are many different departments who've got an interest and a key role for the bill team is ensuring that other departments are kept informed as needed. And when we get to the drafting, then it's very much an iterative process. And this bill was no exception. So uh, instructions come, they're discussed, uh, drafts are produced and uh, discussed and uh, poured over and refined. And that process goes back and forward uh, it can be days, it can be weeks, it can be months, depending on the context, um, until we get to a point where we think that we have a robust um, po- a robust draft that delivers the policy. And that's, um, you know, that's what we're, we're aiming for. Uh, on that bill, as well as the core provisions, there were any number of sort of secondary issues. So there were all the sort of consequential issues that you touched on earlier, but also quite random things like we realised that the Queen's printer had no locus to publish the EU legislation um, as was when we exited the EU. And so we had to bring in new powers to ensure that the Queen's printer um, arranged for the publication of the statute of the EU statute book. Um, and then when the bill was in Parliament, obviously it was, uh, it was subject to incredibly intense scrutiny um, and there were concessions and amendments made, um, perhaps most notably Clause 13, the so-called meaningful vote provision, um, and you know some of those amendments have to be worked up in incredibly quick time, um, and then it's not a case of written instructions; it's a case of sitting in a room and working out uh, what you're going to do um, in order to get it tabled in time for the next the next uh, stage of Parliament. And you've got a lot of people who um, want one word. I remember some of those discussions on the meaningful vote want one word moved here or there, thinking that it will make an important difference, which it possibly does. Um, and that's so interesting what you're saying about the receipt of instructions, because I think that before um, I took over, I was probably in the same position as most other MPs and thought that the government would hand you a policy, which might be a policy paper that had been written and say, please turn this into law. But it's not like that, is it? The departments have to send you specific and detailed legal instructions asking for precise things, which you then turn into what will become a statute? Yes, because often those policy papers, um, they, they cover the whole policy, um, but only aspects of that policy may require changes of the law. So it's for the um, lawyers within the department to work with their policy officials to work out which aspects of their new policy actually require changes to the law. And it's only at that point that really they will be bidding for legislation and coming to us. Um, so it is very much a, a joint effort and Parliamentary Council and the team within the department feel very much as one team through the project, um, all with their different roles, but very much working together. And do you ever go back to departments and say, look, you want to change the law to do this, but don't you realise you can already do it under this law that exists from 20 years ago? Or should it never get to that stage? It should have been stopped before then. Yeah, it, sh- it shouldn't get to that stage in that lawyers within the department should have um, stopped that happening. You know, I can't think of it offhand of a, an example where an entire bill might fall away like that. Uh, but certainly um, so s- some aspects of the instructions are quite likely to fall away on that basis where you say, you know, they've asked for some specific provision and you point out that they have that power somewhere. Or indeed that they, d- they don't need a statutory a provision to enable them to do something. Some things they can just do and uh, they don't need to um, have statute. And that's, you know, it comes back to, as well as looking for law that is clear and effective, we're also uh, very keen to ensure that the only things that go onto the statute book are things that are necessary. And the statute book is complicated enough without including on there things that are unnecessary. So, you know, creating, making a criminal offence of something that's already a criminal offence, for example, um, and you know we have a sort of saying in our in our office that those unnecessary provisions that have, are not intended to have any legal effect they will just go septic down the line because um, understandably a court would assume that anything we put in a statute is intended to have legal effect um, and if you didn't intend it to to mean anything new then inevitably any effect you give it will be the wrong one so we're always keen to ensure that the provisions that are in the bill are necessary. That's a very good point that. Um... Uh, if you've got something that already has effect and it's the effect that you like, simply reiterating it must intend to create something new. I, I, I like the logic of that. 
And and it's it's that that I was going to come on to next because your role is to explain this logic to uh, departments and improve civil servants' knowledge and understanding of Parliament and the legislative um, process. And what, what what does this involve? How, how do you get across to civil servants who may have a very good idea that they're promoting their department's policy with um, the right way to go about getting that into law, or indeed using other existing powers to do it. How do you explain to them what they should and shouldn't be doing? The purpose of legislation is to change the law. And so um, I think usually when we have the conversation, um, the officials are pretty receptive to the idea. And indeed, taking a bill through Parliament is no easy task. So for a department to discover they don't need a bill is not necessarily a devastating discovery. Um, They might be quite happy if they can go off and do it in some other way. Um, There may be a particular reason for having a bill in any particular case. And if I think back to the modern slavery legislation, um, quite a lot of the provision that was made in that legislation, um, there there were alternative provisions that might have been used. I don't think they were necessarily on all fours, but they were in a similar territory. But for very good reason, it was thought that having... Um, a bespoke modern piece of modern slavery legislation was very important. And one of the reasons it was important was that because it raised the profile of modern slavery. Um, and I think that was shown um, through research to sort of drive prosecutions and inquiries in a way that just relying on some more generic piece of legislation just wouldn't have um, done. And so sometimes there is good reason for um, doing something, even if it is um you know, in the same territory as something that's already on the statute book. So, you know, there's not a blanket rule here. It's always um, a matter for discussion with the department and to understand why they think new legislation might be needed and to work with them to see whether that's really the case. And recognising that there can, as with the Modern Slavery Bill, be exceptions. Um, but I've, I've heard a rumour that you sometimes explain uh, how the legislative programme process works via a board game. Is that right? <laughs> We do. Yes, we do. So uh, we have a board game called Legislate. So we developed this board game a few years ago um, as a fun way to introduce civil servants to uh, the the legislative process and all the different aspects of um, developing a bill in your department and then taking it through Parliament and just illustrating to officials um, that it is not, you know, uh, a two minute process. And it's been incredibly effective, I think, um, to sort of through a sort of um, medium of a board game to have to facilitate that discussion about the the nature of parliament and the nature of legislation and how you would best go about um, getting your legislation through and and that work has really led on to other work around parliamentary capability where as a civil service I think we were conscious that um, we could do more in terms of um, understanding parliament both its processes but also its context to ensure that we can provide the best possible support to ministers. Um, And that has led to a whole other um, string of work, including um, some excellent uh, training, which has now been developed by civil service learning for civil servants on all aspects of parliament, not just legislation, but select committees um, and all sorts of other things. Um, And we've also now got a network of senior officials, our parliamentary champions, throughout um, departments and, and their, their role is to promote uh, the need for parliamentary capability in their department and to support the officials in their department who are doing that work. So um, I, th- I think this is really key to um, getting the best out of our work in that um, we produce bills and we want parliament to understand those bills. We want to take them through and give parliament time to scrutinise them. Legislation is always improved by scrutiny. And all of that is improved if the officials who are working on it really understand the processes and the context, the difference between the House of Lords and the House of Commons and how they um, best adapt their approach to deal with those things. Well, I I hope the board game will become an app and then perhaps I can persuade my children to play legislate rather than Fortnite. Um, But that may be unduly optimistic. I'm sure it will be a bestseller. I think it will. It was certainly, I, I think, if I can't, sell it amongst the re-smog children, I'm, it may not go very far because they're quite political, but I'm, I'll have a go when the app is available. I, I'll certainly enjoy it. Um, 
But I was going to end on the fact that you have a, a unique and important distinction in, in that your office has always previously been held by men and you're the first lady to become first parliamentary council. And there's a wonderful series of um, portraits uh, of, of your predecessors. Um, and I hope there will be a great portrait of you to celebrate this. And you've been awarded um, the QC honoris causa for your great contribution to the legal work of this country. And I wonder how important this is to you, to having broken this particular glass ceiling, and whether you think it makes a difference to how um, your office has functioned. So I think working in the Office of Parliamentary Council, we're all very aware of our illustrious um, predecessors, uh, not least because, uh, as you say, many of them have their photographs on our office wall. Um, but also because we spend a great deal of our time studying and amending their handiwork. Um, so the office uh, was established over 150 years ago. Um, so first and foremost, I think I feel extremely privileged to be the first parliamentary council and to lead you know, my committed group of drafters who continually go above and beyond what um, is possible uh, to deliver. Um, and I'm sort of very proud that over the course of the last 30 years, our office has gone from having just a very small handful of women to a position where around 50% of parliamentary council are women. Um, the first women to join the parliamentary council office joined before the Second World War, and they didn't have an easy time. Um, they got paid less, they had fewer prospects, they had to resign if they got married. So for me, the most important change really is that um, 50% of our um, colleagues are women rather than me being the female head of the office. But at the same time, the more work that I've done when I've been heading up the office, speaking to people um, earlier on in their careers, the more I realise how important it is for people to have people of different backgrounds, men and women, at senior levels in an organisation. Um, I think it's only if they can see people like them getting on in an organisation that they can see how their careers might progress. Um, so given around 50% of our council who are women, I will hopefully uh, not be alone with my photograph on that wall for, for very much longer. Um, and I imagine you would recommend being parliamentary council to other people thinking of what careers to take on, uh, with the one absolute proviso being that you have to have an enormous brain, because it seems to me that being parliamentary <laughs> council is a wonderful job, but I would never have been clever enough to do it. And, and I think we're very lucky to have such brain power in this country that we can write good laws. I think you're too modest. Um, yes, I'm not sure if we all have enormous brains, but I certainly love the job. Um, and I think uh, one thing that you would find if you came to our office that is that everyone loves the job. Um, it is an amazing job to do. If you're a lawyer and love the law, um, what could be better than writing the law? And one of the great aspects of the job is that you get to delve into so many different areas of law. I think as, as lawyers in private practice in particular, you can get quite pigeonholed quite early um, and end up focusing on quite a narrow area of the law. Whereas as parliamentary counsel, you can be drafting tax law one year, criminal law the next year. And um, that's a really fascinating aspect of the job. But yes, it is, um, it's a privilege. When I, when I go and speak to children in schools about careers, um, I'm always trying to say to them that it is a privilege to have a job that is hard. Uh, because if, if the job was easy, you would be very easily bored. But you certainly don't get bored in the parliamentary council office because the job is always hard and stretching but always incredibly fulfilling as a result. I think it must be. I, I just look at it and think that on a daily basis, you are writing the next chapter of British history, but doing so amending the last chapter of history. And that must be just always so interesting and, and exciting. Um, Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining this podcast and for uh, the work that you do which is essential to the functioning of our democracy. It, it's so crucially important. Um, and particularly, thank you from me as Leader of the House, because the Leader of the House's job would be a much um, more difficult one w without the marvellous work of the um, uh, Parliamentary Council. Thank you very much. In the next episode of Why Parliament Works, my guest is Robert Rogers, 
Lord Lisbane, who served the House of Commons across a 40-year career in masterly fashion. I am very much looking forward to hearing his reflections on his time performing perhaps one of the most underappreciated, but certainly one of the most important roles in our parliamentary democracy, that of the Clerk of the House of Commons. Until then, goodbye.